Hello everybody, welcome back to the Two Norries podcast. I'm your host James and I'm joined as always by my good friend Timmy Lamb. Hi everyone. And our Today guest... me and James are going to see them jumpers if you haven't noticed. We, are too, <laughs> we, we went to a corporate event today dressed in the same clothes. So, uh, yeah, that was interesting. The Two Norries uniform. <laughs> but uh, our guest today is Sinead Gibney, the Chief Commissioner for the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. Bang on. And uh, you've a rake of titles as well. Like <laughs> we met at the Gashka Awards. We hosted uh, Gashka Awards. It was around um, specifically around the Criminal Justice Awards. Yeah. And it was in the Google headquarters. It was amazing venue, wasn't it? Yeah, mm. yeah, it's a fab venue. And I used to work in Google, so it was kind of yeah. weird for me coming back. Just, yeah. Uh, a Three sixty view of Dublin. Yeah, it's gorgeous. From, yeah. from the penthouse. But um, that was where we got to meet. But when I was introducing you, you were, you were about six masters or something. <laughs> <laughs> Two masters, uh, and then three uh, other postgraduate qualifications. Yeah, like, yeah. So I'm, a, I'm an absolute, uh, yeah, I'm a, a, an addict. I love, uh, I love learning, and I will continue to do masters and courses as long as I live. Yeah, I love them. Can I ask before we go on? Can I ask you a question on that? <laughs> because this is coming from somebody that finds it difficult to, yeah. to the educations. How? Is it just a learning thing? Can you sit down and read? Is there no problem? Have you no issues uh, with any no, of that? No, I do. Like, I hate it when I'm in it. Like, yeah. you know, kind of, yeah. I, hate, I hate moments of it. And yeah. I hate a lot of the, it, the you know, the, the fact that it, you have to sacrifice your Monday and Tuesday evenings or whatever it is that you do when you get into the routine of it. But I love the, I just love the exploration and I love it as a way to, I mean, any, any, I did my bachelor degree, uh, my first degree in the 90s, like when I left school. And then all of the other qualifications I've done, I've done while I'm working full time. And most of them while I was taking care of my daughter, I'm a single mum, you know. Mm. So uh, it was a, it was an escape for me as well as anything else. And a kind of an intellectual space to explore different ideas that allowed me to enjoy my work more and to detach from work and other areas of life a bit more. So I, it's not that I find it easy, but, but one thing I will say is they get easier. Like mm. my second master's was a whole just a different ball game compared to the first one because you just you get to see that with any of these learning experiences you get as much out of it as you can put into it yeah. and when you're working full-time the reality is you cannot read every single academic paper and sometimes you can just read the introduction and the yeah. concluding yeah. remarks or the concluding <laughs> observations or whatever and that's enough you know and like you have to be realistic with that um but one master's i did in particular the second one was absolutely life-changing it was the equality studies masters in ucd and i recommend it for anybody because it will absolutely shift your thinking it teaches critical thinking in a way that was utterly new to me and kind of really ultimately helped me to leave the private sector and move into the public sector where i found a much more rewarding career than i ever could have mm, in the private sector. so before we get into the career and, and all the stuff you're doing today we'll take us back to where are you from and what was it like growing up uh, so I'm from Dublin, uh, although I grew up in England for a few years. My parents were, my dad is, is an academic, was an academic. So I was made in Australia, actually. And my mum was seven months pregnant, coming back to Ireland with me. And then six months old when they moved to Southampton, grew up there for seven years. Don't remember a whole lot of it, weirdly. I don't know what that is. Uh, and then been back in Dublin since. And um, yeah, I mean. Um, we that, always bright in school. Uh, no, where? Uh, was I always no I mean I was I was a trier compared to like my sister was very uh she was head girl and all of that sort of stuff I struggled a bit more in school I was a bit rebellious and um yeah didn't always land on the right side of the teachers if you know what I mean so <laughs> <laughs> just <don't. laughs> yeah. Yeah. company here yeah. <laughs> but I thrived in college I have to say and I did I ended up being president of my students union I loved Great. college I went to college up north and uh, Coleraine, Coleraine. Oh, Coleraine and it was fab because I mean other than that I've lived in South County Dublin yeah um and and I mean maybe just to say that to check my own privilege I come from a you know an affluent white uh, yeah. settled uh, family the most natural thing in the world for you to go to university yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. totally was but it was also a big a big experience for me because it was away from home, whereas a lot of my friends in, in South Dublin went to UCD or Trinity, stayed friends with the people they were friends with, stayed living with their parents. Yeah. I was uprooted and, and in... Uh, Did George Heist to do that? Yeah, it, yeah, kind of. I missed just missed the course I wanted in Trinity. 
and there was a really good history school in in uh, University of Ulster. My sister was already there, so that made it a little easier. And so you uh, did history. I did history in my primary degree. Yeah. Okay. And what yeah. kind of history would you have been interested in? It was modern and contemporary history, and I specialised. And the the area I was really interested in was the development of political thought. So socialism, essentially, like yeah. I did my my thesis on uh, how the information revolution was going to affect the development of socialism. And I had this great idea that basically it would level everything, that when we all had access to education and information, it would be such a leveler. Like this is in the late 90s now, before yeah. the internet really, we understood what it was going to be. Yeah. Not that we still do. But. Oh, yeah. And uh, so that was your first degree. Yeah. What did you do then? Did you go into the private sector working or...? Uh, I jumped around a bit. I was in, I've had a real patchwork quilt of a career, if I'm honest, like, and I, so I started in public relations and then I moved into the NGO sector. I had my baby and, and uh, came out of work for a couple of years when I had her. And when I came back in, then I was in the NGO sector very briefly and then in academic uh, institutions, but not in academic roles, just running projects and uh, different things like that. Um, and then I got a job in Google, which was uh, which was just an amazing opportunity. What role was it? So the role I went into was learning and development. Uh, I would basically built up a team of people who developed e-learning solutions for internally mostly. And um, but when I went in, I was always intent on getting into a more philanthropic role. Yeah. That's what I was interested in, and I was very fortunate that I was able to. And uh, while I was there. They, the leadership within Google Ireland essentially created a new role uh, and I, I got it and um, got a teammate as well. So. You know, that's the role, philanthropic role. Mm. Explain a little bit about that for some people. Yeah, yeah. So in in places like Google, I mean, it's a big multinational and uh, within the company, there's lots of ways in which staff volunteer and uh, the company donates money. And so those philanthropic and voluntary activities they're handled different ways in different offices across the world. So um, they didn't have anybody in Dublin to essentially manage it and a huge staff in Dublin. And there was just a lot of interest, you know, both amongst the leadership within the company, but also the staff. You've got a very young, energetic staff who are just interested in different causes. Uh, so that's essentially what I did was I built up a team called Social Action, we called it, but it was what most people would know as corporate social responsibility. Yeah. yeah. And um, we did things a little differently, I would say, because one of the things you find with CSO or corporate social responsibility is that uh, a lot of companies, it's like it's it's quite self-regulating and in, in many cases self-serving. I don't have a problem with self-serving, but it's it's not always very well um it's not results driven. Yeah. So often, and oftentimes if it's results driven, it's much more about kind of creating opportunities for the staff mm -hmm. rather than thinking about what you're actually doing for society. So we wanted to do that differently and the leadership in Dublin were with me on that. So we brought in two kind of key principles, which was uh, that we would engage the staff at the top of their skill set as much as we could. So we didn't want people who had degrees coming out there, whatever's and languages yeah. and everything else go and paint in houses because like, you know, yeah. that you can just put their skills to much better use. And then also that we would only um, that we would focus on a, on a specific issue, because what you find with CSR programs and social responsibility generally is, uh, you know, a company will pick a theme like, say, education, and then they'll just do a whole smorgasbord of activities related to education. What we wanted to do was really look at a social issue and think about it as you would any other business problem. So we looked at specifically uh, internet engagement for older people. And I had targets around, I had to reach 3,000 people through education initiatives, 6,000 people through awareness initiatives, whatever it was, I'm picking them out of my head now, but it was yeah. something like that. And, you know, and that's what we did. So we, we tested models and, um, you know, built stakeholders. We, we brought together a coalition of groups who were all working in the digital, digital inclusion and in older people's, um, older people's rights. Um, and then we also worked with government to try and tell them, well, we've tested these out. Here's how we think you can look at digital inclusion. Because still, I would stay, say, and certainly at the time, when the state in this jurisdiction and in other states as well, when they look at digital inclusion, they tend to think about it from uh, an employment point of view, jobs creation. And yeah. whilst that's really important, we were looking at it much more around social exclusion and the digital divide. And I think we're all, all at, at a better understanding of what that means this side of COVID, mm -hmm. but it's still a massive, yeah. massive issue. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, it was a really, I was really privileged to be in that role in Google where, 
it's you know there's not many jobs like that in a company like it's google it's interesting to hear the, the level of detail that went behind mm. the corporate social i was a part of a charity before and uh, there was this big company they wanted basically what what it was was they had a certain amount of hours that their employees could donate to yes. the charity but the, the charity then feel obliged to take them yeah. on, but it actually costs you money to take them on yeah. because you have to look after them and you know you have to you can't just leave them on their own you know but then you, like when you're in the charity you never say no to anything like that because you're trying to keep the relationship for down the line yeah. But uh, it's great that uh, with Google there was more thought went into it. And the yeah, we were we were really determined to to battle against that exactly that, yeah. and and that was hard in in an American multinational because that is very much a cultural uh, thing from America. Like that is how yeah. CSR is handled in America. Is I mean I've heard stories about NGOs in America where they'll take on teams of corporate, uh, you know, away days or whatever yeah. to paint a. A school building yeah. they'll have the same building painted 20 times in a month so yeah. that they you just find stuff yeah. for them to do it's yeah. not really a value to you but as an NGO you feel like you have to kind of take mm. the offer yeah another offer try and come, come down the line they might be financially you know blah 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 well yeah. also because they're, they're the other reason they'll do it certainly in america i don't know about here but uh is because they want it they know that those people are are people who earn money and who will donate if they if yeah. you, you know if you go yeah. out and pay the school for a charity you're much more likely to donate to that charity so they'll do it sometimes at an expense knowing that they'll get a little bit of return in terms of donations yeah. but it's it's ridiculous like it's i mean and you know the, one of the directors who I worked with said that if one person in the company can cure cancer, that's our program. Like, obviously, we're not going to make 3000 people feel good about themselves yeah. when you can have a much more targeted yeah. impact. Um, but but nonetheless, actually, we did have huge levels of staff engagement and we did our best to deploy people in ways that were meaningful. So, you know, helping NGOs to develop online marketing programs, because that's what most of our staff do in their day to day work. One of the things we never really got going was tapping into the translation skills, like there's 60 odd languages in the building. Yeah. And we were trying to just find ways, but it's just, it was hard, you know, to, but I think now actually there's probably more, more potential for it, you know, with a lot of the challenges that we're seeing with new communities settling yeah. into Ireland, where multinationals have all of those languages in the building yeah. to help with that, you know, and, the, and those translation skills are needed in really yeah. crucial situations. Do you know, when you were, uh, w when we met you up in Gashka, you said to me that uh, you had your own issues with alcohol as well. Yes. And that you admired what we were doing, which was lovely to hear. Yeah. But I think it's good that uh, somebody with your status in your position, um, because people might think that like somebody like you would have it all easy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But like, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, we can all struggle, can't we? Yeah, totally. And I think it's so important to to name it you know and I, I think I said at the time like you know we're so far ahead now in terms of discussing mental health than where we were a decade or two ago we're just not there with alcohol and, and addiction and every family in Ireland is touched by addiction in some way or other you know either close to you or a little further away so yeah I I mean and we've we've had plenty of it in my family and um 11 years ago now on New Year's Eve I chose to give up drink and at the time I was giving it up for 18 months I was uh doing one of those masters and I was uh, working in Google in that role and I had my daughter. So I was just like a huge amount of demands on my time. And I just recognized that I was like, whenever I had time with Bella, my daughter, I was hung over, you know, I mean, or like, I just didn't have enough quality time with her. So I decided to give up for 18 months and uh, essentially so that I could do one of everything and then something like, you know, yeah. a date sober, a holiday sober, you know, whatever, um, a Christmas sober. And then, but within, I think about 12 months, I, I knew that I would, I would never drink again. I would, it was just, I mean, it was just, yeah, best thing, one of the best things I ever did. Um, there's, there's something very great to take from that, you know, when people give up alcohol or drugs, mm. they give it up forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they think, I'm giving this up. Yeah. I, don't, I have to give it up forever. It's like, if you can do it now, I'm giving it up today. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give it up for a week. You know, yeah. and you you said that you had a number, I'm going to give it up. But in that meantime, you started to notice that your life was exactly. getting better. Yeah. You were feeling better. You were noticing things that you'd never noticed before. And yeah. you were appreciating them. Because that's how it happened. a lot of pain as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I, yes, like, there and was. The, and the 18 months was interesting because when it's like, and people, you know, obviously this time of year, people have done dry January and some people have extended it a bit further. But I think when when you're given up for a number of weeks, although of course any 
period without alcohol is, is good for just yeah. refreshing no matter who you are, no matter how much you, you drink. Yeah. Um, but but you're you're essentially only waiting until you can drink again. Whereas eighteen months is a little more. I felt like it just was going to give me a flavor of what life was like without alcohol, and and I and I did like I, I you know I I think within a month had a pretty tough time dealing with you know as they say you take away the painkillers you feel the pain, and you know I I, I speak addiction speak now I, I I understand it I didn't immediately. Uh, access um, addiction services. I, I about nine months later um, went to an addiction therapist, and he was fab. And I'm a big fan of therapy anyway. And uh, and like most of my therapy experiences, we didn't really talk about my addiction much or deal with it necessarily. But he was skilled enough to to help me through that period. Um, but then a few years later, um, I I ended up uh, starting AA meetings, and I actually just I found such a I didn't I didn't go for long. I went for about two and a half years and it was honestly it was a time in my life when I couldn't really afford therapy. Yeah. Yeah. It's the <laughs> best it thing was... about, listen, there's nothing wrong with that because they're in every yeah. community. Yeah. Uh, every day. There's no waiting lists, yeah. there's no assessments. You'll go in, you'll sit yeah. down and people will look after you. Yeah, and it was a lovely it's a it was a lovely place that I found where there was a real kind of, you know, people who were there a long time. So there wasn't kind of the same white knuckle you might find at some of the meetings. It was yeah. very relaxed and people talking about the value of sobriety in their lives. And one of the things that really struck me in AA was I saw men being warm to each other and yeah. caring in a way that I don't see in any other setting. That's a beautiful thing. It's amazing. Yeah. And it really is that yeah. fellowship. Like you, you know, you know, um, even that 12 step program, like that's a great way for anybody to live their life as well. Yeah. Not just people who are caught up in addiction, but across yeah. the board, people who just want to improve their lives, yeah. you know, look at themselves, look at some behaviors that they, they don't want in their lives anymore. Maybe look at a, a, an area of their life where they may have, hurt somebody and they want to go back and make an amends, you know, or they want to bring sp some spirituality into their lives. Yeah. It's great for that. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's, it's for everybody, not just people caught up in the region. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, like, I didn't do any of the steps. I did, um, I did take part in the meetings and I shared and all of that, yeah. but, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't do the trust list. I may do them at some stage in my life, you know? And I mean, people in my life, uh, would many people in my life would be surprised to hear me talk about addiction and and I have I, like I mean I remember people saying to me when I gave up drinking but Sinead you're such a fun drunk you know and I remember one other friend said to me when I told him it was 18 months and he said okay I'll see you in 18 months and you know so like people will be surprised to hear me talk about it but like I've made peace with it and yeah. you know I know it's hard when you do step away from it to to maintain those friendships because yeah. you know that was one of the first things i learned was i yeah. you know our, we are friends as a peer group because we all drink at a certain <laughs> level you know yeah. and 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 do you know do you know because uh, uh, uh the podcast that i host with timmy is a recovery based podcast timmy's my friend he's in yeah. recovery my wife jillian's in recovery all my friends are in recovery mm. and i'm open about it do you know yeah so People don't come up and ask me, do you want to have a pointer? Yeah. Is it difficult for you being at conferences or events and stuff like that to kind of like uh, say no to the wine and people might be kind of go on, children, I have to long day. Is it difficult for you in social settings? Not not really, to be honest. Um, I just am so on sure footing with it now, you know, and I'm very happy to just quite quickly let people know that I'm not a drinker, you know, I'll, I'll it, like it functions and stuff. I'll just tell them, please take away the wine glasses because otherwise it's just, it's not yeah. even that I'm just worried. It's just, like, it? stop hassling me for wine. I don't want I any, yeah, yeah. but it, no, the, the harder thing for me was, was that kind of, uh, I mean, the way I describe it was my friendship landscape changed. Yeah. And um, I, you know, I've kept in my life the people who are important in my life and uh, but I see them in very different ways and I see a lot of people a lot less than I ever did, you know, and than I did when when we were drinking together because, you know, they do. Many of them still would have similar patterns as as as, as when I was drinking and I just there's you know, not in common anymore. No, exactly. That's yeah. it, like, and there's not yeah. different about it. But actually, yeah. That, that can be a huge drive yeah. for people to go back to yeah, exactly. you know, feeling yeah. that disconnectedness and that isolation, yeah. you know. It's like, especially if all their friends that they've grown up with are still doing the same yeah. thing. Yeah. And you haven't quite got the new friends yet. That's a difficult space yeah. to hold, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And I was in Google at the time and it was actually really interesting because in Google even, you know, uh, just having the eyes of, of people who are not Irish, like, you know, because it was only at the time, I think about a quarter of the workforce in Google Ireland was, was Irish. 
So, you know, having and a, and a lot of them, you know, feed into the same commentary, you know, Osha, the Irish are great crack and all of that. But they also, you know, are taken aback at the volume of drink. And, you know, and so having that was helpful. And also having a friend group, essentially, you know, yeah. within my colleagues who did other things, yeah. <laughs> yeah. related activities. Civilized yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, like daytime yeah. things. And, and you know, I signed up at the time to a few of those, like Hello Sunday Morning is a great yeah. uh, email. I mean, I never really got too into any of them. but And there's loads since, I feel. There's a lot more since, like the Soberistas and... There's a lot more resources for people. Um, and I think there's more options, like, you know, because, I mean, looking back now, like, I still think abstinence was the only way I was ever going to stop drinking. And, and and for me, it's just so much easier than considering, yeah. like, having a, a glass or two, just, I just don't see the need, you know. Yeah. But um, but I do think that's not the case for everybody. I get that, yeah, of course not. you know, course other not. models. But you made a good point, and uh, Timmy said as well, like, if people are listening and they're contemplating it, just give yourself the week or give yourself a milestone. Yeah. Maybe get to Easter and then you'll yeah. review it at Easter and then maybe try and get over the summer. And w- when I was uh, in rehab, the residential side of it, the thought of like not drinking was like daunting for me because I yeah. say I'm a drug addict. I'm not, the alcohol is not <laughs> my problem. But the council says to me, give yourself 12 months. Yeah. And then after 12 months, if you feel you want to have a drink, then go and have a drink. Yeah. So then it was like, that was manageable. Yeah. Then after 12 months, I looked at how my life was after changing. Yeah. And all the opportunities I had. It's like, I'm not giving that. A drink isn't that good. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's sure. overrated. That yeah. is one of the key lessons that I learned quite quickly was, and I would say that to anybody, it is overrated. And it's only when you step away from it that you see that. Yeah. And what's the first thing we think of when we face some adversity in our lives? Do you know if something yeah. really yeah. good? What is this? A drink. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or something good happens. Reward. <laughs> like it's drink. the same. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. drinking you. Like it's it's all about catching that thinking as well and becoming aware that if you're if you're off the drink and you're in recovery, yeah, you have to understand that the minute something difficult pops up in your life, maybe something goes wrong in the family or someone dies or yeah, something just doesn't go your way and it's upsetting you and you're feeling a lot of pain internally, the mind will automatically tell you. Let's go to the pub. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. Let's get a bag or whatever. You know, so it's very yeah. important for people to understand how the mind works as well around mm. addiction. You know, because when you are facing some form of difficulty in your life, your mind will click straight into that. Yeah. And look at the easiest way to get the pain away. Exactly. And that's drink yeah. or drugs. Yeah. Do you know when you were uh, you left the private sector? Yeah. And what was it like? You're a human rights. You're the chief commissioner on the Human Rights and Equality Commission now. Yeah. How did you end up in that role? Um. So uh, again, it was not, not not quite straightforward. If you like, I mean, I left Google. Um, essentially, with not knowing what I was going to do, like I didn't I didn't have the IREC job uh, when I left Google, and I left. Uh, you know, kind of thinking I had some ideas around what I wanted to do, setting up by myself and do consultancy type stuff, and then. Um, Quite quickly, the director job came up in in IREC and I went for it. Didn't think I'd get it, <laughs> and I did. And um, and I, I was probably a little bit of a surprise appointment for some people, but I, I mean, I think so. The 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 I mean, just to give you a little bit of a an explanation of the organisation because yeah. it's quite complicated from a from a governance point of view or from how we're organised. So the chief commissioner um, is one of fifteen commission members. And we're all appointed by the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, and uh, we are independent officers of the state. And IREC is the National Human Rights Institution for Ireland, and we're recognised by the UN as being an ace status body, which means that we are independent enough and we're resourced enough to hold the state to account on its human rights and equality obligations. And uh, But obviously we can't do that alone, so we have to have a, a, a team of people to do that. And at the moment we have 90 staff and they're headed up by the director. And they are civil servants and they have to be essentially because they're state employees. But nonetheless, we are uh, accountable directly to the Oireachtas. So it's complicated because you have to build within essentially the state infrastructure a mechanism by which you can still hold the state to account. Mm-hmm. So I came in as director and I came in at a time when we were merging two former uh, bodies, the Equality Authority and the Irish Human Rights Commission. And um, and they needed somebody. I think, you know, the reason I I, I did uh, get the job was because they needed somebody who was just uh, had good management skills and and was able to build up the organization. And I came from Google where I'd learned so much in terms of all of that good management structures and 
um, you know, strategic planning and all of those those uh, those kinds of skills. Uh, so that's how I came in um, as director. And I mean, I just absolutely loved it. I did the role for two and a half years and it didn't quite pan out in the way that I thought. Um, so, I mean, I was very proud of what I did in the co- in the time that I was there in that role, but essentially felt it was the right time for me to move. And uh, this time I did start working for myself and yeah. I did all sorts of things. I did media production. I ran for election. I did training, uh, facilitation. I ended up in Mountjoy actually at that stage facilitating a session, brilliant session between Mountjoy and Maynooth when they were building their uh their program together um so just did all sorts of stuff and then went for the chief commissioner gig in 20 well it was 2019 I was appointed in 2020 but again you know I mean I don't mind saying these things I didn't think I'd get it yeah. <laughs> you know, again as chief going commissioner for such a high position what's mm. the interview like like is there a tree on the panel do you have to go back for a second interview do you have to do presentations yes you do yeah yeah when I was uh, for both of them they were so for the director one there was actually five for the chief commissioner only four uh on the panel and yeah, there are two interviews each and the second one would normally have, but both of them had presentation components. So, I mean, I'm pretty good at interviews, I yeah, think. Yeah, sounds, like, sounds like it. I have <laughs> um, to get yeah. some good roles, like, down through the years. Fair play. But it's yeah. a skill, isn't it? It is a skill. And I've taught interviewing skills, both to people who interview and who are being interviewed. So, uh, so I've done a lot around that space. So I think, I, yeah, I was well positioned. Yeah, to, I have a few uh, last three or four interviews I've done now, I think I did really well and I got the yeah. positions. But there's a few disasters at the start, you know, when you just come out of college and you're a bit green. Yeah. But it's just something that you have to have the experience and you can't buy that experience, you know. Yeah. Make sure yourself, embarrass yourself, but you won't do that the second time. Yeah, exactly. And you have to, I mean, you have to be yourself, you have to relax in them. And I really feel for people who are who struggle with interviews and who are nervous in interviews because I can see sometimes in interview situations and I've done a lot of interviewing like when I was director we were building up the team so I mean I think I'd quantified it at the time I did something like 200 interviews and placed 35 people reviewed about a thousand CVs so like you know seeing what people do when they sit in that chair is just fascinating I mean that is a study on humanity and I really feel for people like and I, I do find as well that you know as an interviewer what I try and do is just make people feel at ease and just create the conditions for them to be their best selves and present their best selves. But unfortunately, not all interviewers are trained to do that. Some interviewers are actually quite nervous themselves. They might not be that skilled at it. And that, I think, sometimes doesn't help where they will make somebody feel nervous. And, you know, uh, we were at a corporate event today. We spoke at a corporate event company, big company, private company, and they asked us what can they do in terms of their processes around uh, interviewing people with convictions and stuff yeah. like that because it is it is very daunting when you're in an interview you know the question is coming um what what advice will you give for interviewers in terms of how how they would phrase the question or how, how, how they would go about it yeah i mean like i'm a big believer in the competency-based interviewing model and or honestly if not that then some model like have a structure for your interviews and communicate that structure to your candidates in some shape or form. That's yeah. why public sector interviewing is very positive because yeah. it they, they, it's a clear framework and you know how to master it essentially before you sit in the chair. So now not everybody does do that, but um, so as interviewers, but like really be quite explicit in, you know, I'd always say to somebody, you know, you're here for the interview for this job. We're going to talk to you about these competencies and we're all going to ask you questions on it if there's multiple people in the room. Uh, you'll have the chance to ask questions at the end. Now, best of luck in the interview. And I always finish with that phrase because I want people to know that we're rooting for you, you know. Yes. And I think as interviewers, you can do that and smile at people and make eye contact. Like, yeah. it's amazing how, like I say, interviewers themselves get very nervous yeah. and they don't do that. And when you, if you're like looking, you know, taking notes and looking down, people just lose their kind of connection with you and they just don't, you know, they don't so show their best. The interviewer notes. needs to be confident. In what yeah, they exactly. Ask and say, look, it's just... It's not a big deal. Yeah. If, there, if there's something there, but some most of the time it, they don't really ask at interview level. If you're being offered the job, then it might it might come up then. But like a, a real champion for people like ourselves is Lynn Rowan, Senator yeah. Lynn Rowan in this area. What do you think uh, around spent convictions? And do you think like that? Um, do you know better spent convictions for road traffic and public order after mm-hmm. seven years? Do you think that all 
offences should come under there or some or how would you approach it? Well IREC has put out a policy statement on this in 2020 and um, we do think that there should be a ground essentially for you know a, a, a discrimination ground for, for criminal convictions and absolutely we think that the spend convictions um, our position is that it needs to be reviewed to be uh, much more expansive essentially you know taking account of multiple um, sentences for example and for the thresholds to be reviewed because at the moment they're just too restrictive for people, many people to be um, to be able to access. And I know Lynn, uh, uh, Senator Rowan has done a lot of work and there's there's legislation on it at the moment. But the other place we're currently working on this is in the future um, or the equality legislation review. So the Department of Equality is currently reviewing all equality legislation and looking at the grounds, but also about the framework of how people access yeah. uh, equality legislation, which is the key way in which people combat and deal with discrimination here um, in Irish society. And we think that there should be an additional ground of criminal conviction. So that would mean that uh, people can be essentially pursued for, for discriminating against somebody because they have a criminal conviction. Yeah. And that wouldn't necessarily, but it, this isn't, you know, this is something we're deliberating on at the moment and we haven't come to a, an exact position on it. But that doesn't necessarily just mean spent convictions either. That could potentially mean that you could um, find a way to combat discrimination for people who have convictions around, you know, e even within the confines of disclosure, for example, or whatever it might be, but, but find ways in which... Basically, I mean, you know, to, to facilitate rehabilitation and to yeah. help with, um, you know, people integrating into society after yeah. after but they've served their sentence. Like for people like myself and Timmy, we've spoken to a lot of prisoners over the last yeah. few weeks. Um, they can do all they can in terms of yeah. depending, doing personal development and therapy and courses and degrees and all this stuff. But society has a role in providing meaningful employment. Yeah. Because if there's if they do all this stuff to move away from that, because when you think about it, if somebody goes to prison, they have to get out at some stage. Yeah. And everybody, even life force, get out as yeah. well. <laughs> so you have yeah. to, like, society has to think, right, what do we want? We want yeah. for that person to not commit crime again. Yeah. Well, you don't do that by blocking them exactly. from employment. Because yeah. that's breeding ground for recidivism and reoffending, you know. Yeah. So there is a role for society to give people opportunities. And when you think about like what they can bring to the table as well, yeah, you know the determination, the goal setting, you absolutely know, the, the resilience, resilience yeah, all yeah. This stuff, you know. Yeah. Well, we were doing <coughs> well, we were doing the talks in the prisons for the last few weeks. One of the biggest questions that we got back was uh, the guard vetting process for yes. a lot of prisoners because they're they're actually. The they're living worry because yeah. a lot of them have probably been off drugs in prison for the first time in their lives and they have yeah. a bit of clarity and they're probably understanding that exactly I have three kids at home, yeah. I have a wife at home, they need me, I need to go home and get a job. Yeah. And they're understanding, geez, how can I get a job? Should the guard a vetting process? And then that kind of knocks them back down to the bottom of the pile again. Yeah. You know, we need to... It needs I to went be laser all. precise. It That's needs, what I... Like, it, yes. you know, I appreciate there has to be guard a vetting, yeah. but it should be absolutely you know specific to the the area or the 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 the, the potential um crime or whatever you know what i mean there has yeah. to be a clear reason why somebody is guard abetted not to participate in a particular activity and that i mean because i think you know we can go down one route or we can go down the other and i mean if you look at america now you have i mean essentially ghettoized people who are post incarceration because they are so restricted from you can't there's 400 meters from this place or you know whatever else like you're can't finding water in some states yeah, yeah in most states and i mean you you're literally corralled into i mean physically a, a neighborhood whereby you're not going to infringe on any sanctions but also then of course like you're just not able to engage in society mm. you're not able to participate so i do think we have to recognize the importance of, of a mechanism like guard vetting for public safety i fully accept that but it has to be done proportionately and it has to be done with laser precision for the the reality and not just kind of blanket oh we'll guard a vet because and you know like insert name of profession here mm. that's not yeah. how we go about it certain certain employers use it as a filter yeah tool. exactly they filter out that employee yeah and yeah. that's very disheartening yeah i've had a few bad experiences now and interestingly they were volunteer roles oh really yeah and i was looking and they were in the criminal justice world yeah. as well the NGOs and uh, or, or else an organisation brought in by a criminal justice organisation anyway mm -hmm. and uh, now I have 
spend time in prison. My guard of it and doesn't come back blank. You know, there's a couple of pages there, but yeah. there's nothing there. Crimes against children or mm. sex crimes or arson mm. is a big one as well. So, like, it's not relevant. Yeah, exactly. But, like, I'm 10 years away from that lifestyle. Yeah. I have a bachelor's degree, I have a master's degree, I have a world of personal development done. Yeah. What? Why are you, why are you yeah. looking at something I did when I was 19 and 20, yeah. you know, 17 years ago, and it's not relevant? It shouldn't yeah. even be in the conversation. So it shouldn't. Why yeah, don't they, exactly. sorry, um, why don't they include just the 10 years of stuff that he's done after his last conviction? So that it comes with context. Into yeah. the guard of vetting yeah. and read the guard of vetting and then you go on to 2013. Yeah. James gets into education. He does his level five, finishes his degree, goes on to do a master, starts a doctorate, gets a job here, gets a job here. Yeah. You know, that's never on Exactly, it. yeah. And like you say, it just becomes a filter. And, yeah. and, and, and I think it's not, I don't think it's always nefarious. Like, I don't think those NGOs probably, yeah. like, they've probably been advised from a security or a risk point of view to do this, well, you know? So, sometimes it's the... It's not the actual people, the people in the yes. organisation want you. Yeah. There's board of managements, yeah, then are yeah, saying yeah. no, or you know, boards of directors, or there's yeah. legacy policies that are outdated. It was stuff like that, kind of, in my experience. But saying that, I've had a lot of opportunities then where people, like, all you want is for people to hear you out. Yeah. So, for example, when I was with, the, I won't name any organisations, but HR, they, like, they were impressed with the interview and they just wanted to sit me down and talk to me about it. Mm. That's all you want. Yeah, exactly. So you can give yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. if you get yeah. to meet somebody, they're going to know, right? There's no risk here. Yeah, yeah, you know? totally. But a lot of the time, you don't get that opportunity, and yeah. that's very disheartening. Yeah. You know, as a as a human in your office, like, what's the big human rights issues at the moment in the state? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I, direct provisions, di direct provision, the immigration system at the moment, and particularly those uh, people who are uh, the international protection system, rather, and those people who are seeking uh, refuge here and not even getting a, a place to stay. That is a, a very critical issue right now. I would say um, the group who are most marginalized in our society are travelers and uh, the, the I mean, the outcomes for, for the traveler community across all heads, employment, education, health, life expectancy mm. uh, are just so problematic. I do think that is still Ireland's biggest human rights and equality challenge. Um, but I think the other the other thing is economic inequality. And I mean, that's our one of our strategic priorities, because I think I mean, we do work a lot on issues that affect um, marginalized communities and, and by their very nature, often smaller parts of the yeah. population, smaller groups within the population. But economic equality bridges over all of those groups and then some, you know. And I mean, at the moment, I think the um, the, the deepening inequality is is um, is just a huge issue that we have to address. And it's a challenge for organizations like ours. It's a challenge for human rights to address uh, economic inequality because it's uh, states are much quicker to correct issues around civil and political rights, for example, because it doesn't cost them anything. Yeah. But as soon as you start to try and realize economic, social and cultural rights, it costs the state money. Mm -hmm. So we put out a policy statement recently on um, our vision, which is that ESC rights, economic, social and cultural rights should be put into the constitution here in Ireland. They're not at the moment. Um, and we particularly believe that the right to housing should be expressed within the constitution. And there is going to be a referendum probably on that. Um, and it's not what people think, like if you put a right to housing in the Constitution, that doesn't mean that everybody gets a house. And um, it, but it does mean that the state has an obligation to better protect vulnerable groups within the housing market or the housing sector. So it, it places additional obligations on homelessness, uh, responses to homelessness. But also, I mean, we did a report a couple of years ago on uh, with the ESRI around monitoring um uh, adequate housing so um, really just kind of setting out six uh, criteria which we thought helped to define what is adequate housing so things like security of tenure standards of housing and so on um, and certain groups come out really poorly across all of those dimensions so lone parents is one group for example disabilities people with disabilities uh, migrants you know overcrowding for example is huge for for migrant communities um, so there's so those I think for me if we were able to make headway and certainly in my term of office I would love to see us make some way a headway in terms of just recognition and realization of economic social and cultural rights but it's a it's a very hard uh, area to tackle 
And one of the things within that that we're looking at within this strategic cycle is care. And we're currently running a campaign around this uh, called Care About Equality, where we're naming the unpaid care in society that women mostly undertake and which prevents women from gaining equality within the workplace, but also equality in the domestic domain and, and within communities. Um, because that is a real barrier for women in terms of accessing the kind of work that we should be able to work, should be able to access uh, and achieving greater economic independence and security uh, the same way that men do, but also advancing within the workplace, you know. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, the reality is, for example, that a, a couple, a man and a woman, say, who are both working outside the home, uh, in paid employment outside the home, still the statistics show us that the woman in that partnership will do double the amount of housework and 50% more of the childcare. So it's not about just, it's no longer about that breadwinner model, you know. With maternity leave and stuff like that, even though it shouldn't, it affects the prospects for promotion in, yeah, the, in exactly, the workplace yeah. as well, even yeah. though it shouldn't, it does. Yeah. And a lot of this stuff is implicit as yeah. well. Like, you know, Do you think we're still, it's still kind of a continuation of, of the, the old culture where the woman, do you think we are changing gradually? In I that think area? we're changing gradually, but way too slow. Yeah. So we still yeah. live in a patriarchal society yeah. is, is the way I say it. I'm a we have a gender order yeah. and we can't like, you know, and I, I think particularly around Women's Day, it's great to acknowledge that we're changing and yeah. that a lot of men are taking on care roles, which is really positive. But we can't gloss over the fact that we still are living in a patriarchal society and women have a lot more barriers to participation than men do. Um, and personally, um, I and as an organisation also, we support the introduction of quotas in certain situations which we believe will accelerate and advance women's rights in a way that yeah. it's just not going to happen naturally. We would be hundreds of years waiting for the doll to have 50-50 representation. It would have happened naturally yeah, if it was exactly, going to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so you do need to push these things. Um, and, and absolutely, it's we, are, we all carry patriarchy we're all a product of, of this society so it's this isn't you know when I talk about gender equality it's not an anti-men message we no. we all as a society have to look at how women are able to thrive and survive in this society and mm. and at the moment it's not on an equal footing yeah. like you say in the workplace for example like in the countries where there are better balanced gen um uh, uh, parental leave policies for genders so for example in some of the Nordic countries one parent will get six months leave the other parent will get six months leave and you can't shift it over so if in that case again if it's a man and a woman the woman might take the first six months and then the man take the second but if he doesn't take it it doesn't transfer over yeah. and and when that happens men are forced into care roles to, they, they they understand care a lot better they understand the challenges of being a, a full-time carer at so home you, you'd be in favor of that Something like that, absolutely. And I think it's the road we're, we're headed down. I, I think would most Irish men would. Yeah. <laughs> I think most men, Irish men would be delighted to be home. I don't know what that's <laughs> me. No, do you know what, though? I will say this, and, and I, want, I yeah. wanted to say it. Like, without my wife being in her role at home, we, we'd be nowhere. Myself yeah. and two kids. She's, she's, she's basically the, the one who runs the whole show. Yeah. You know, and you were right. Women do most of the housework and most of the child wearing and she does her own full time job then as well as yeah. that you know and it got me thinking I was sitting here and I was saying fucking bollocks yeah <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, and you it's know, not just because, like, men, I think as well, like, there is a tendency, oh, well, I do this or I do that. Yeah. Women still organise it most of the time. Yeah. That's the other thing that I gets me, that mental labour that we undertake. For me, it's 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 like, it's, it's just, it's, it's not um, that I actually intentionally leave her do all these things. It's like, it's like, it's just yeah. like I'm sitting into a role as being yeah. a parent. But I, I actually, from listening to you, know, you kind of... <laughs> <laughs> you should be actually doing more at home. Yeah, you and know? instigating it. Like, that that's the thing for, like, I think it's important to acknowledge is that it's not just about, you know, it's very hard to say, well, I'll do this and you do that. But oftentimes, you know, and I've I've had men respond to me on this and they'll say, yeah, but w women want to run the place. And no, like, <laughs> we want to have yeah. a balanced, most of us, I think, want to have a balanced uh, relationship or dynamic within any domestic setting, be it with a partner or whatever else your situation is, where everybody pitches in at the same level, you yeah. know. And I, I like so I, you know, I, I do think because the point going back to that, the parental leave thing, yeah. not only does that affect the domestic situation, but that man now goes back into the workplace having had the experience of leave. And as a manager, he's more understanding of what that means. He understands that it affects your visibility, your promotion and advancement opportunities. Because when you are, when you have to take mat leave and you have to take other carers leave, because it's not just children that we disproportionately care for, it's older people in our lives and 
um, and, and lots of other ways. Uh, when you've taken that leave, like you realize it's really hard to advance in the workplace. And w men, when they're forced into doing it, or not forced into it, but when they're, when they're legislated to do it, uh, they do start to realize that and they become better managers, better colleagues yeah. as well. Yeah, to bring that kind of topic into the prison environment, we spoke to a lot of female prisoners over yeah. the last few weeks as well. And you know what you know what you learn is from when the men go to prison. Mm, mm. The usually the woman is looking after the kids on the outside. She's passing up the few quid for the runners and the tobacco and visits yeah. every week, bring the kids up, getting the kids communions and confirmations and all that. But when the women goes in, yeah. the kids go into care yeah. and they don't get anybody calling up to them with runners or money for tobacco or visits or anything like that. They're on their own. Yeah. And that's another example of it. It's yeah. sad. It is. It's really sad. It's and sad. I think when women go into prison, there is such a greater impact on the people that they are leaving behind, you know. And I, I mean, I think that's it's very statistically clear that that's that that happens. Um, so I do think there has to be ways in which we can improve diversion and, and ways in which we can avoid uh, women going into prison. Because uh, I think the reality is for many women in Irish prisons, they don't need to be there in many cases. There was a lady on our podcast recently. Her name was uh, Edwina Grossinger. Lady Edwina. Lady Edwina, she's a... Oh, yeah, I didn't listen to it yet, yeah. but I've seen the Good episode. Well, that you would, yeah, for And sure. um, just in context to what we're saying about women going into prison and the kids being left at home and, yeah. and then the worry of, of the, oh, the kids okay. Yeah. I can imagine how that must be for a mother. Yeah. But they've recently... Um, they're at the end of construction of a place called Hope Street in, in, in um, is it Southampton? Southampton, yeah. Oh, cool. Where, That's where I grew up. Yeah. instead of women having to go directly into prison, they'll get an opportunity to go into this residential facility with their kids. Fact. Fact. So they don't, have, they can spend their time there. It's yeah. open. You know, there's therapy there for, for them. Like there's school. everything yeah. on site. Yeah. You know, it sounds absolutely amazing. And yeah. this lady's a philanthropist as well. And she's done this on her own back with other people who are, yeah. who are helping out as well. And it makes so much sense, doesn't it? Yeah, it absolutely does. And I mean, not just for women prisoners. Per yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, personally it, it should be. But I do think there is a particular experience of women prisoners and there should be a particular facilitation to, you know, to keep them in the community and to keep them in their families as much yeah. as we can. Yeah. We spoke at the Gosh government about uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the prison system. Yeah. Want to talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the uh, I think you know at the time I and I, I kind of I, I mean I I remember hearing all of the statistics. I mean, the statistics basically being zero cases and how well that was celebrated uh, within Ireland as being a success, if you like, for in terms of infection control in the prison system. Um, and I don't think any of us at the time realised the time how that much that was impacting on prisoners and their families and their communities. Um, and I think that's been, um, certainly since I've been in this role, uh, something that's come to my awareness, uh, you know, a lot stronger. Um, and I think one of our strategic priorities is, is future proofing, we're calling it, but which is, I'm not thrilled with the name, but anyway, it's about saying like, if we hit future, if we hit crises again, be it kind of a sudden one like COVID or even uh, the longer running, obviously climate crisis that we're dealing with, we have to find ways in which when that crisis happens, when emergency powers kick into action, when we deal with things in a way that is out of routine as a state, mm. we have to find better ways of protecting the people who are most vulnerable because that did not happen in COVID. Um, there was certain, I mean, and, and the voice of prisoners was just not heard. What we heard was the prison system claiming success, yeah. but we didn't hear the other side of that. We didn't hear what that meant in terms of the deprivation of rights that prisoners experienced because of infection control. Um, and I think that's, you know, we can't go in, we can't enter into another crisis with that mindset. We have to be more careful about... Uh, what, what kind of rights was infringed? Well, I think, I mean, the right to family life, you know, I mean, and I think this this boils down to the kind of the real nub of uh, certainly how I see prisoner rights is there's still a lack of appreciation, I think, within the general public that when your freedom is deprived, you're not supposed to give up all your rights. Like, that's not what prison is. Um, it's a, the punishment is the deprivation of liberty, but that does not mean that you should be deprived of any other rights. And I, so that, that's the kind of thing that people experienced was just a lack of connection with their family, a lack of, um, you know, bodily autonomy and, you know, the ability to even access S schools, was yeah, closed, gyms, services, closed. exactly. Yeah. You know, there was, um, you know, two weeks quarantine for people yeah. coming in, in isolation, um, lack of visits, stuff like that. And the impact on mental health for prisoners is just for people in prison is just huge when those things are taken away. I mean, 
So I think those were, you know, those are the issues. And But I do think there was additional issues around the, the emergency powers, how the emergency powers that applied to the prison service were uh, monitored. It was slightly different to that of the, the kind of legislative powers that were brought in. So there was definitely oversight problems as well. Yeah. Um, that again, I think we just need to be more watchful of if, if we're ever going to enter into that kind of a crisis again, where, where those kinds of measures are going to be taken, we need to be clearer on it. Um, and, and one of the things that I think is really important is the is the N NPM, the National Preventative Mechanism, uh, which is incoming, although it's been incoming for quite a while now. Uh, so and we have a role. So as the National Human Rights Institution, we're going to be the NPM coordinator. Um, and that will come into effect essentially when we ratify OPCAT, which is the optional protocol for the Convention Against Torture. And that is a part of the Inspection of Places of Detention Bill, which is currently in the legislative process. So um, so what that preventative, I mean, it's amazing to hear people. I was just in Geneva last week and we were talking to kind of our sister uh, organizations in many other countries. And actually the topic was about the prevention of torture and about the the NPM um, structures that many many of these uh, organisations are, are implementing at the moment, and I mean, I mean, we we ratified or we uh, signed up to the OPCA, to the Convention Against Torture in I think two thousand eight, wasn't it? And then so it's I think sixteen years, essentially, before we're now ratifying it. We're one of the outliers, but one of the last in Europe to do so. Why does it take so long? Um, the state has a policy uh, of when they when they want to sign up to something like an optional protocol, their their take on it, their policy is that we have to have all of the legislation and structures in place to operationalize it. I have a problem with that. I, ch I challenge that because um, we're never ready. Like, I mean, and we're saying the same, same thing with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The optional protocol to that is not ratified yet. It will be with the Assisted Decision Making Act that's coming through in April. But those are, you know, I, I appreciate there's no point in ratifying it and then start from scratch, but somewhere in the middle, surely, like, you know, because that delay is just too long, 16 years before we're essentially seeing that. I mean, when I was director eight years ago, we, when we were starting as IREC, we were, thought we were going to be the NPM immediately. And, you know, it's still in the works. Um, but it is going to make a big difference because what it will allow for is this uh, preventive mechanism to prevent against torture. So it will allow for much more um, uh, wholesome inspections of all places of detention. So there will be a uh, an NPM, uh, basically a body assigned to each of the different sectors. So the inspection, uh, the, the inspector of prisons, which will be renamed, uh, is will cover the whole justice sector. So they will cover not just prisons, but also um, guard, stations. guard stations, transit um, and so on. And then I think HICWA will be looking after direct provision and there's so and the Mental Health Commission, I think, uh, for um, institutions, uh, for some institutions. But, you know, w like one of our recommendations, for example, is that they can't be too prescriptive within the legislation because there are places which are de facto places of detention. So, for example, if you're detained at the airport or revenue, you might not be in the list, but we have yeah. to have ways in which those places can be inspected as well. And all of the different bodies who are then assigned, they have powers to do um, uh, announced and unannounced visits, uh, to inspect, to and uh, like certainly from what I'm learning about this from other jurisdictions and other countries is that uh, a huge part of it is the relationships that those bodies build up with the prisons, so like or or the other places of detention. Yeah. So it's it really is a quite a collaborative process and it's a positive process and it is about prevention. Mm -hmm. And again, like if those things had been in place, we wouldn't have seen in um, in COVID what we saw with direct provision centres where there was no capacity for infection control. Uh, like we wouldn't have seen that um, that response within the prison system that was so rigid and so kind of extreme. In, and, and again, not to take away from the success of infection control within that, but like just there would have been greater consideration of prisoner rights in we, the introduction of those. We, we spoke to somebody recently, they run a hospital and... Uh, we were talking about COVID-19 and what it was like in the hospital at the time. And he was on about, you know, for some of the staff that would have been caring for patients in their last hours of their lives. Mm. Then double body bagging people, the family mm. never get to see them. He said that was overkill. Looking yeah. back, that in hindsight, it was inhumane. Yeah. And, it, and you know, it, it affected the rights of the family. Mm. But you think that in COVID-19, there was such a panic to control the infection that that kind of trumped individual rights and family rights. 
Yeah, exactly. And I like, and I don't. I mean, for some of those decisions, I just can't imagine what it was like being in those mm. places of decision making. You know, to to deal with how to handle a situation yeah. like that. So whatever about what happened, I do think it's about how we prepare for the next. The long from it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think the inquiry, like, I think it's really positive that the government is looking at that. I do think they need to look at it through a human rights and equality lens and, you know, really Absolutely. think about it in terms of not just the health and medical response, but also what it meant for people and what it meant for infringement of rights for people. Because I do think we need to look at that. So, for example, you know, like I know kids in care, like, you know, we, there was a lot of talk about education and how uh, how how kids were able to kind of go online or, you know, um, and even within that, certain kids could go online. If you have, you know, the Internet, if you have data, if you have uh, if you're not like if you're living in a in a caravan in a halting site and you've got, you know, no space like, you know, there's My wife was working in a youth reach at the time. Yeah. And the car key to be supplied laptops to the young people. Yeah. But they didn't have the way they, they didn't know how to work. You don't have to, yeah, exactly. And the parents didn't know. Yeah. And there was the pressures on the families that are home. Yeah. They're opening the laptop and that is it on? Do you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, do you know, there was, there was so many struggles at every kind of, at every kind of solution, there was another problem cropped up. You yeah. Know? And if. So certain groups were, were fine. And, and as usual, it was the same groups who were not fine. It was people with disabilities, it was travelers, it was people with lone parent families where those those what we what many people see as quite a simple fix and a switch to online learning just wasn't possible yeah. but then for kids in care that wasn't just the only thing they lost they lost not only education but access to key workers to psychologists so you know like there was totally unseen groups throughout any of the public debate I think and that's what I mean when I talk about when we future proof we need to make sure that we don't lose that again because yeah. uh, if you know there will inevitably be more crises um, yeah. and like I say some of them will be sudden but even just thinking about the climate crisis and how we're responding to that what that's going to mean in terms of jobs and building you know we're pushing for a just transition we've got a, a policy statement coming out on this um, to really kind of uh, you know make sure that when we talk about climate we don't lose sight of human rights and equality that we make sure that you know when we think about displacement of labor for example through automation and AI that we are also considering what that means for people you know um, so so I think yeah there's there's lots to learn from it it's been a pleasure speaking to you. You too. Thank, Thank you, you so time. much. Thanks for your time. Thank we could have a lot of there. Yeah, yeah, cool. That flew it's, in. Uh, fascinating. And, oh, uh, I could literally sit here all night. Yes, sir. <laughs> this is lovely. Because there's so much other stuff I'd like to talk about, but I'm so grateful for have to have you here and, and to... Pleasure. To have a conversation. Yeah, and thanks for being open about your personal experience. Oh, no, I'm delighted well. to actually. It's kind of good to yeah. it's good to get it's good to talk about that stuff. It is. I mean, and and it'll allow other people in in in, in yeah. a similar position to you to say, Do you know what? Yeah, exactly. What, yeah. What's wrong with? I know. What's wrong with? Yeah. It's not normal, like. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Quite the opposite. Yeah. You know, yeah, like exactly. you get so much yeah. from it, you should be able to speak about it. The amount of people that come in here with little notepads and yeah, and then folders and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even the tea shock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he just got chatting and that was it then. What is it? I hope you enjoy your stay at oh, Thank you so thanks much. Thanks for coming down to me.